Oh, what do you have there, Professor Friston? This is The Experience Machine by Andy Clark, my friend Andy Clark. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, I started reading it, actually. Yes, <laughs> I can <laughs> see you're on page 17. So, so how's that going for you? Really, really good. Um, I, I was reading it and I was um, quite struck by some of the similarities to, um, to active inference, actually. Yeah. And um, uh, in the first chapter, he's, he's talking all about how in the olden days, we used to think of the brain as a kind of Cartesian theater where signals come in and you have these uh, kind of refinements of representations. And then there's this mind, presumably then there's some kind of infinite regress. But of course, neuroscientists knew about all of these back connections in the brain. And um, I guess this is where you came along, Carl, that this whole new way of thinking about brains as prediction machines came about. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, I regard him as a brother in arms. So he, he's he's the philosopher. I'm the sort of physicist theoretician. But effectively, I think we're telling the same story. But yeah, you know, he's a beautiful writer. Um, and also, just to pick up on that sort of, um, is the brain extracting information from its sensorium, or is it a constructive organ creating, generating expectations and predictions, hypotheses? in which to basically make sense of the world. He has a wonderful way of explaining that. So he says that the 20th century was very much of a sort of outside-in view of the brain. It was all this information coming in and somehow in some hierarchical, recursive way, you'd extract the right meaning from that information. But of course, nowadays in the 21st century, the story is exactly the converse, one of Dan Dennett's strange inversions. It's very much an inside-out process, you know, generating with exactly those backward connections that you, you mentioned before, generating predictions, explanations. Is this the right way of explaining what I'm sensing? And if it is, then your predictions match your sensations, job done. And if it's not, oh, I've changed my mind. And basically, this is, I think, yes, I was pleased and honoured to write one of the um, one of the blurbs for this. I actually used the phrase, this is a book that grabs you and literally changes your mind. <laughs> That's a nice coincidence. <laughs> and I've just noticed, yeah, a little story about Andy. So, and if I remember correctly, Andy started at Sussex University um, with the good and great, like, um, Margaret Bowden, and then um, after an itinerant and glorious career involving America, ended up in Edinburgh, which he loved, but he couldn't surf in Edinburgh. So he's always <laughs> wanted to get back to Brighton, back to Sussex. And a few years ago, um, uh, Anil Seth, who's himself at Sussex, who I noticed here has also written some lovely blurb, I'll just read that. A predictably groundbreaking exploration of the predictive basis of our extended minds from one of our deepest and clearest thinkers. The experience machine delivers a remarkable combination of profound insight and practical relevance. So Anil was very um, pleased with himself. And I remember joyfully declaring when he'd actually secured Andy Clark or headhunted him from Edinburgh back to Sussex so that they could, <laughs> well, I say they, um, Andy and Alexa could go surfing again. And I remember the, 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 the point at which he got confirmation of Andy's headhunting. We were actually trapped during a, a, what they call a Medicaid, a hurricane in the Mediterranean on a little Greek island f drilling down, I think it was on um, the mathematical basis of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and, we were incommunicado with the waves raging outside and Neil Seth was playing the piano and he got this phone call to confirm that he'd managed to secure Andy Clark's <laughs> chair at Sussex several years ago. So from what I understand, Andy is now happily, was he a cognitive philosopher? Yes, I, I'm, I'm incredibly jealous of, of his job title, a cognitive philosopher. That would be my aspiration one day to be a cognitive philosopher. <laughs> yep. Surfing and philosophy. So, the, yeah, he emailed me about this, um, must have been before Christmas, saying he'd, he'd, he'd written a pot boiler. Uh, and would I, would I like to just look, you know, pass my, uh, uh, read through it briefly. 
I had to Google what a pot boiler meant. <laughs> Apparently, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a brief and cheerful book to make money. But when I, <laughs> so I read it beautifully written, uh, but then I had to reread it to write the blurb, and it's, it's certainly more than, a, more than a pot boiler. It's actually an interesting synthesis of, um, I think, where that style, uh, certainly Andy's style of thinking about life and making sense of the lived world and physically um, engaging with that world, where he was prior to predictive processing and active inference before the sort of um, the pragmatic turn or the inactivist um, shift, you know, as we move from the 20 to the 21st century. So before that, he was, you know, he was famous for things like the extended mind, um, you know, the designer environment, that, you know, that we in the spirit of sort of niche construction, we actually create our own niche, we create our own environment in a way that makes it much more predictable and affords the opportunity now to sort of download a lot of our cognitive capacities into the world. They are like our memories are now in our iPhones. And then he's basically taken those foundational and fundamental ideas and contextualize them in the context of the modern predictive processing and, and active inference. And, you know, and this yeah. is the synthesis. Yeah. A lovely read. I wanted to pick up on something you just said, though, because when I was reading the book, I was rather struck by this idea that we live in a hallucination, uh, which is conditioned by actual sensory information. But let's say 90% hallucination and 10% sensory information. And from an inactivism point of view, what's really interesting about that school of thought is that we create the world that we live in as, as well as the world creating our own kind of sensorium. And that's just something that really struck me as being quite interesting. What's your take on this living a hallucination? Well, I, yeah, I, you say 90% uh, hallucination and 10%. I, 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 I probably <laughs> to 100%. But, uh, um, I, you know, that's absolutely right. So you know, if you believe that everything that we perceive as being real is a hypothesis, you know, uh, the product of a constructive organ, a statistical organ, uh, you know, a little scientist that just is our brain, then all you're saying is that the sensory data are just in the service of confirming that hypothesis or this alternative hypothesis or, or another hypothesis. The key observation being it's all hypotheses, it's all fantasy. So, you know, using the fantasy word is nice because it means that the brain is literally a fantastic organ. It's a purveyor of um, a device for basically adjudicating, choosing the right hypothesis as a best fit to this sensory data. Because, as you point out, um, it's not just the fact we are sessile brains, creatures, phenotypes that are delivered of data. You know, Andy Clark would, would express this in terms of this you know, sort of outside-in process. We actually have to actively select those data by moving, by palpating with our fingers, by moving our eyes around. We are in charge of the data that we now solicit to verify or disconfirm our hallucinations or our hypotheses. So that's the inactive part. That's a sort of, you know, uh, actively engaged in a way that induces this kind of circular causality. So, you know, we are certainly constrained by our sensory data. We are, uh, our, our, our predictions and our hypotheses are informed by and contextualized by sensory data, but at the same time, the ensuing hypotheses underwrite the way that we sample the next bit of data. So there's this wonderful sort of autodidactic, you know, physical engagement with, you know, with, with the lived world. Yes, yes. But I would love to um, understand where the autonomy comes from. And, and the reason I'm asking this question is there have been many papers on ChatGPT recently that have essentially built an outer loop to find different prompts. So if you think of GPT as an information retrieval system, there's an outer loop to explore prompts in the neighborhood of the original prompts. And this is very similar to what you're saying from the inactive point of view. Now, there are books about how we think with our bodies. And you just said that there's an, an outer loop that says, well, I now need to explore with my physical body 
in my physical environment to get more information to do inference? And what process is doing that outer loop? What process? So I guess the body is in and of itself just a hypothesis. Um, and therefore the answer to your question, um, it can't be that the self is, if you like, driving this active engagement, this sort of active learning and active um, inference about the way the world works. If it is the case that the self is actually emergent from, or a, an explanation we bring to the table to explain all of these data, so there must be something underneath that. Um, and um, as a true Bayesian statistician, uh, your, my answer would be there are some prior there's some prior belief, and I don't mean belief in a sort of folk psychology sense, I just mean in terms of some um, probabilistic distribution, some probabilistic specification of what it is to be something like me, and then something like me goes around self-evidencing, acquiring sensory data that um, supplies evidence for my model of this world, and I suddenly have the hypothesis, well, this world actually includes me as an agent, as an artifact, and then I develop a sense of self. So I guess your question is, where does, where does the autonomy come from? As a mathematician, it comes from autonomous differential equations that underwrite the itinerancy and the, um, technically the, uh, you know, the attracting sets of the attractors that characterize me that specify the characteristic states that I will um, remain in. So technically speaking, I can, if you like, elude the question about where does autonomy come from? But, well, it comes from autonomous differential equations that characterize an attracting set of characteristic states that make me, and you could actually simulate that. You can simulate all sorts of things that have this sort of biomimetic aspect, you know, walking, talking, writing, all of these basically being um, a physical realization or instantiation of these autonomous dynamics that, you know, in a very straightforward way, are physically realized by our neuronal dynamics. However, I suspect that your word, use of the word autonomy was, was not quite, <laughs> not quite diff wasn't so um, technical or deflationary. Um, I think that the, you know, to be autonomous, um, first of all, is to be a kind of thing, a particle uh, or person that can act upon the world. So I think that you know, there's a minimal uh, um, requirement that you have various states that change the states on the outside of you that are external to you, that are extrinsic, that are um, hidden behind your sensations, your sensory veils. Um, that are latent in the sense that you'll never observe them, observe them directly. So to be autonomous is to be able to move, but there's clearly more to it in the sense that if you're trying to um, explain your inactive or active engagement with the world in terms of making sense of the world, you're basically describing active inference, you're describing ev ev an evidence-gathering machine, you're describing self-evidence as Yaakov Howey um, was, uh, would, would uh, express it. Uh, another um, brother in arms and a friend of Andy <laughs> Clark's. Uh, and another, I guess he'd probably be very pleased to call himself a cognitive uh, philosopher. Um, but he, you know, um, Jacob um, sort of uh, has uh, not invented, but certainly repurposed the notion of self-evidencing um, as a a, a, um, a very succinct and neat way to describe this kind of predictive processing that has this that active engagement and active flavor. For me, that would be active inference. And what is it? Well, it's just basically gathering evidence for my models of the lived world. So then you say, well, okay, what underwrites this evidence gathering? It's the generative model. It's the model um, that you are gathering evidence for and you're continually updating that model. And I mean generative model exactly in the spirit of generative AI, um, that there is an implicit and possibly sometimes explicit model that you are gathering evidence for and that model affords the opportunity to generate the kind of content that um, um, will be generated or observed under that model 
and hence you, you can look at generative AI and large language models exactly you know, in, 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 that, in that spirit. So the question now reduces in terms of where does, it, where does autonomy come from? It really comes from the generative model. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from, you know, probably from your mum and dad uh, in two senses, not just your epigenetic and epigenetic specification, but also the sort of cultural niche construction, the way that you're brought up so that you have, if you like, a specification of the characteristic states that make you a good son or a good daughter or a good conspecific um, that now undergird the generative model and then you seek evidence for your model and you learn the particular specialization of the parameters of your model by being brought up properly and by being autodidactic later on in, this, in your the autonomous sense or showing the autonomy that comes along with self-evidencing. Yeah, I've tried to get autonomy <laughs> into as many different <laughs> sentences as possible for you. Beautiful, beautiful.